Ship Management to Operation. This module aims to provide relevant information about the areas of a ship's operation management that have a significant impact on a ship's energy efficiency. Upon completion of this session, you will give an overview of how the shipping industry works in terms of ship types, cargo types, and shipping segments. Explain the importance of management level activities such as fleet planning, maintenance management, and fuel procurement on overall energy efficiency and energy cost. Explain various types of shipping contracts and how the contracts influence ship operation and energy efficiency. Explain slow steaming and its impact on ship fuel consumption and relevant technical issues. Describe the importance of ship loading and ship capacity utilization for energy efficiency. Discuss the issue of just-in-time operation, the concept of virtual arrival, e-navigation concept, the use of ECDIS and weather routing, and how all of these can be utilized to save energy. A number of topics are covered, including the legal frameworks and shipping contracts and their impact on energy efficiency efforts, fleet optimization and slow steaming, barriers and best practice, ship load lines, maximum ship capacity, and planning to maximize fleet capacity usage. The concept of just-in-time operation, its fuel-saving impacts, and virtual arrival. E-navigation and the move to digital charts and other support tools such as ECDIS, weather routing, and voyage analyzers as enabling technologies for future optimal management of ships. The structure of a shipping company is determined primarily by the nature of the trade in which it operates and by the size of activities. For example, a tramp operator will generally be different from that of a much larger liner company. Irrespective of the size of the company, its structure should be designed to permit good and fast decision making. An example of the typical departments in a shipping company is shown in the diagram in the slide. The operations department. This is the most important department for a shipping company. The main job of this department is to maximize the economic and safe deployment of the ships through a number of activities, including planning and scheduling that is deciding where to send the ships and when. A significant level of coordination is done by this department. Coordination is essential, not only with other internal departments, but also with the ships, charters, ports, agents, and so forth. The technical department. As the name implies, this department's main responsibility is to keep the ships in a seaworthy and good maintenance condition. It is in charge of such matters as the ship's maintenance and repairs, including overhauls, technical repairs, routine maintenance, and new building projects. In the shipping sector, there are various ship types and sizes. There are also various cargo types, including bulk materials such as wheat, grain and minerals, liquids such as crude oil products, containers, packaged and refrigerated. Ports are used for loading and unloading cargo, as well as for loading fuel, fresh water, other supplies and for discharging waste. Ports impose physical limitations on the ships that can visit and charge fees or levies for their services. Apart from the different types of ships and cargoes, there are also different shipping segments that ships are engaged in trade 
according to geography of operations. Some include deep sea shipping, short sea shipping, and coast shipping, which is famous in the region, for example, in PNG and Fiji. Shipping segments are defined by operations and the set of the scheduled trades they are engaged in. These three are the common ones. One, liner operations. A liner operates according to a published itinerary and schedule, similar to a bus line. Tramp operations. Tramp ships follow the available cargoes, similar to a removal van. Industrial operations. Usually, the owner or charterer manages the cargoes and controls the vessels used and aims to minimize the cost of shipping their cargo. They operate within a wider company business framework and thus differ from the other two segments previously mentioned. There are various time periods for shipping company planning. There are different stages of planning for liner, tramp and industrial segments. Any decisions made during the planning stage can have wide-ranging impacts on fuel oil consumptions, FOC, and greenhouse gas emissions, GHGE. The choice of speed is critical to fuel oil consumption. The choice of speed is a crucial commercial and operational decision. Ships normally are not operated above the design speed and also have a minimum speed to ensure safety. The limits to ship speed are the upper level or the design speed and the lower level, the safety of the ship and its assets, as well as economic aspects or the commercial requirements. Decisions on speed are made in various ship segments and determine which considerations are taken into account. Other major operations of a shipping company are the regulatory compliance, maintenance management system and fuel costs. The International Safety Management Code or ISM specifies the rules and regulations for maintenance management that influence the shipping industry. The ISM code stipulates that each operator is responsible for the safe and pollution-free operation of the ship and the ship's hull, and that machinery and equipment should be maintained and operated in accordance with applicable rules and regulations. The part of the ISM code on maintenance of the ship and its equipment describes in general how ships should be maintained, inspected, non-conformities reported, and corrective actions taken. Accordingly, the ISM code states that the shipping company should establish procedures to ensure that the ship is maintained in conformity with the provisions of the relevant rules and regulations, as well as with any additional requirements which may be established by the company. Based on the ISM code, it is a requirement that the company should identify equipment and technical systems that through sudden operational failure may result in hazardous situations. When implementing a maintenance management system on board a vessel as a part of the shipping company's safety management system, it is imperative to define the critical systems and equipment. Maintenance instructions according to manufacturers or other policies should be issued to ensure the uninterrupted and safe operation of the ship at all times. Operations are dependent on ship deployment and fuel costs. Other important operational aspects include the following. Ship port visits and operations, including its arrival, berthing, and departure times at port. Clear communications among the port administration and shipboard personnel is imperative, including a significant level of coordination. The choice of ports is part of the business or commercial planning, but port calls coordination 
is part of the routine planning. The role of the management in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The shipping company management has overall responsibility for reducing greenhouse gas emissions within the fleet. Although the Shipboard Energy Efficient Management Plan, or SEEMP, is prepared for each individual ship, the shipping company management must look at the shipping company as a whole to achieve maximum fleet reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. It is important for management to take the leading role in reducing the fleet's greenhouse gas emissions. It is important to look at the shipping company in a holistic manner to achieve maximum greenhouse gas emission reduction. Fuel saving, a win-win scenario for ship operation economy and for the environment. The process of the commercial shipping of goods and passengers is a complex system involving many players. A ship's manager should be aware of how these elements interact if they are to formulate an optimum strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the fleet. To achieve the maximum reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, it is important that the company or operator has effective procedures to improve the energy efficiency of the ships that it operates. Looking at individual ships in isolation will not achieve the highest results. The company should also implement procedures which limit any onboard administrative burdens. The company management needs to define and communicate the company's values and aspirations and detail how the company intends to achieve the objectives of their energy management plan. This should include identification of roles and responsibilities, the setting of targets and the monitoring of performance. The company should look at ways of improving the utilization of its fleet capacity by planning. Strategies can include avoiding long ballast voyages through improved planning, reducing downtime in ports, reducing the time it takes to load or discharge by improved cargo handling capability, installing equipment so that ships can use shore power supply, and using weather routing services to plan which vessels to use on a particular route. Incentives for operators to save fuel. There is no doubt that an energy efficiency policy implemented and managed correctly will not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions and pollutants, but will also reduce fuel costs. This in turn will reduce the operating costs and increase the company's overall profits. If the ship burns less fuel for the same amount of work done, it will reduce the ship operator's costs, which could also reduce the cost of shipment, which may be then passed on to the charterer and ultimate buyer. It is a win-win situation. In many cases, there will be no simple answers to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But considering all the options available and deciding on the most appropriate strategy will be a very good start for any ship manager. The ship manager should not focus on one particular area, but consider the possibility for savings in the whole transport chain. The incentive for an operator to reduce fuel use and thereby reduce greenhouse gas emissions is reduced costs. While there are many opportunities to optimize and improve operational efficiency, it will require the participation of several parties and it is essential that each party has the incentives and flexibility to join the energy saving effort. It is particularly important that they do not have incentives to contribute to inefficient behavior which means the issue of split incentives needs to be overcome. 
A split incentive refers to a situation where the people benefiting from the energy efficiency are not the people paying for it. In the shipping industry, it mainly occurs when the vessels such as bulk carriers, tankers and container ships are hired under a time charter or a bare boat charter. In this case, it is the charter who pays for the fuel, but the ship's owner who is responsible for any investment in energy efficient equipment. The main types of shipping legal frameworks and contracts of carriage. The purpose of this slide is to provide a brief introduction to the legal frameworks in relation to the carriage of goods by sea. The aim is to make you familiar with the concepts rather than becoming a maritime lawyer. The purpose is to highlight and provide some background on the importance of looking at the contract of carriage when deciding on greenhouse gas emissions reductions for both the fleet and individual ships. This is particularly true for measures that influence the overall operation of the ship, including its itinerary and voyage management. Without such high level considerations, it is likely that the planned energy saving may not be successful or that the ship owner may end up in legal cases for breach of relevant contracts. The following slides talk briefly about the contracts of carriage. Common law. Under common law, there are four basic obligations on the carrier. The four basic obligations under common law are, one, the carrier must deliver the goods in the same condition as when they are shipped. Four common law exceptions are, an act of God, an act of the king or queen's enemies, loss or damage resulting from inherent vice of the goods, loss resulting from jettison, Two, the carrier has an absolute duty to provide a seaworthy ship. Three, the carrier undertakes to proceed on a voyage without unjustifiable deviation. If there is a deviation, the carrier is liable for any subsequent loss. Four, the carrier must complete the voyage with reasonable dispatch. If there is undue delay, the carrier is liable in damages for any loss caused by the delay. Common law. The term reasonable dispatch is a common law term defining the customary and ordinary obligations of a carrier to transport shipments. The term is found in most standard bills of lading. The term generally means obligation to sail without unreasonable delay. Fleet optimization and slow steaming. Fleet optimization for energy efficiency seeks to achieve the following two main objectives. One, increase the ship's load capacity to as high as possible. Two, reduce the ship's operational speed to as low as possible. The objectives may not be compatible with the commercial and business requirements, as well as with the way the ship is designed or operated. Also, occasionally, these objectives may conflict with the best technical management of the ship or the legal framework under which the ship operates. Ship speed reduction can produce significant energy savings. This is agreed by all the industry players to be the most influential parameter in ship fuel consumption. To determine the optimum speed for a particular vessel and the optimum number of vessels in the fleet requires not only a good estimate of the cargo that needs to be transported, but also the number of ports of call and where they are located. Design speed. 
This has significance when the relationship between ship owner and ship builder are considered. Slow steaming. Despite the technically optimized hull propeller engine for a ship's design speed, it can easily be demonstrated that as the ship speed reduces, the hull resistance reduces more significantly than its corresponding impacts on various propulsion efficiencies, thus reducing the ship's FOC per ton mile carried. Ship economic speed is frequently used in shipping and in fact is normally part of the charter party agreement. Service speed is normally equivalent to ship design speed. Maximum speed is normally the speed of the vessel under full engine maximum continuous rating or MCR. Low steaming, advantages and disadvantages. Slow steaming provides the owners or managers with the opportunity to create a balance between commercial commitments and environmental responsibilities, in particular at a time of low charter rates and high oil prices. Slow steaming is one of the most effective ways of reducing ship fuel consumption. Slow steaming has various degrees of benefits and disadvantages as outlined in the list below. The benefits of slow steaming. Generally, those who benefit from slow steaming are the charterer, who benefits from lower fuel consumption per voyage, lower bunkering frequency per voyage, the technical operator, who benefits from lower average engine load and lower yearly cylinder oil consumption. The ship's crew, who benefit from lower bunkering frequency, lower engine load, and longer time between ports. Slow steaming disadvantages. For the charterer, a longer voyage time means higher charter fees per voyage, high auxiliaries fuel consumption per voyage, Poor, more tendency for a ship's hull fouling with subsequent fuel consumption penalties. Engaging additional ships of the line service to deliver the same amount of cargo unless the existing fleet is not fully loaded. For the technical operator, higher auxiliaries working hours per voyage, ship's hull fouling and the need for more cleaning. This will have an impact on the durability of hull coatings. Higher cost of spares due to engine operation at low loads. Engine operation at low load normally leads to more maintenance. For the ship's crew, there are more frequent inspections closely linked to engine low load operation and more frequent servicing closely linked to engine low load operation. Ship owner technical considerations. As mentioned earlier, Slow steaming leads to operating the main engine at low or very low loads. The engine is not designed or optimized for such low load continuous operation, and thus it could be detrimental to engine health over the long term. Therefore, for those owners contemplating using low steaming, it is recommended that the following be considered as part of their evaluation the main engine limits and the minimum load that is operationally safe for the engine to work continuously. Economize the performance and reliability under the engine's part load conditions. Normally, under partial load, the economizer may not be able to generate enough steam and also its fouling will accelerate. Turbocharger operations, performance and maintenance. Propeller performance hull paint type and filing rate, fuel price, overcapacity aspects. It will be necessary to analyze the above factors. It is important to know why the above investigations are needed and how they should be carried out. Ship loading and ship capacity utilization. 
Multiple load lines are used by ships to decide on the level of cargo they wish to carry and which will impact on their port dues. A ship may have multiple load lines assigned freeboards that are greater than the minimum. This will result in the ship carrying less cargo when using this freeboard. This increase in the maximum freeboard will have the effect of reducing the maximum allowable true mean draft and the measured gross tonnage. Cargo capacity is normally decided on most ships by its load lines, which are placed on each side of a ship to show the ship's maximum true mean draft that must not be exceeded. This is normally taken as a summer load line in salt water when a ship is operating in the summer zone, but can vary for timber ships and ships operating in other zones. The location of these different zones are contained in the load lines regulations in the form of a small map, but can also be found in any good seamanship textbook. The measured load lines on a ship is based on the freeboard and watertight integrity requirements contained in the International Maritime Organization International Convention on Load Lines Convention of 1966 as amended and it is defined as a measurement from the uppermost continuous watertight decks to the ship's waterline at its midpoint. International Tonnage Convention The IMO 1969 International Tonnage Convention is used to measure the gross tonnage of ships. The measured tonnage of a particular ship is a cubic measurement. It is different from a measurement of the dead weight, which is the maximum cargo in tons that the ship can carry when at her summer load line in seawater. The gross tonnage is normally used to calculate, among other things, the amount of port dues that a ship has to pay. The cost of port dues can be very significant over the lifetime of the ship so any ship manager will look to reduce them wherever possible. The cost of port dues is the main reason that it can be advantageous to have several assigned freeboards. The reduction of gross tonnage of the ship by claiming the larger freeboard can result in lower port dues. If a ship is operating in a trade where there's draft restriction in the port, lack of transport demands, or where the cargo has a high volumetric value and the ship does not need to go down to its maximum assigned freeboard operating on the increased freeboard, then a reduced gross tonnage can reduce port dues and other taxes that use gross tonnage to charge the ships. Ship loading, the importance of ship capacity utilization. Generally, a ship using more of its capacity during transportation will be more energy efficient when measured in terms of fuel usage per tonne of cargo transported. Thus, ship capacity utilisation becomes an important element of overall ship and fleet energy management. Ships may operate without utilising their full cargo loading capacity. This may be for a number of reasons, from the poor design of the ship to lack of transport demands, but the ship managers look at all options to increase the shipload factor if there is space cargo capacity. If the load factor of the ship and the fleet is increased, then the gross emissions of these ships will also increase, assuming everything else remains as before. However, it is very simple to show the energy efficiency of the ship in terms of grams per tonnage of a nautical mile. Ship loading, proper cargo weight and distribution. Savings can be obtained by using fewer ships for the same operation. This would outweigh any increase due to the increased cargo carried on an individual ship. To remove unused cargo carrying capacity, there must be the right ships in the right place at the right time. This means that it may not be possible to fill the space cargo capacity all the time, even with a large fleet. 
If the cargo carrying capacity can be increased for certain voyages, this would have the effect of improving the overall efficiency of the ship, as calculated, for example, by the Energy Efficiency Operating Index, or EEOI. To achieve a better ship load factor, the whole issue of fleet planning and working relationships with shippers, ports and charterers will play a role. It is not necessarily a simple thing to do, but it is quite rewarding in terms of energy efficiency. Ship storage factor. If a cargo is light for its volume, then the holds may be full, but the ship may not be down to its load line max. The ratio of the volumetric area to the weight of the cargo is called the storage factor and is a very important factor when loading bulk cargoes. If the ship's master and chief officer get their calculations wrong, or the ship is not full, or they have to leave cargo that they ordered behind, it may become an expensive operation for the ship owner. In such cases, the ship owner may be required to pay compensation to either the charterer or port operator. This may also mean the ship will run less efficiently due to lower load factor and produce more greenhouse gas emissions. These calculations are the most important in the case of grain cargoes, where if the wrong amount of cargo is ordered and the ship is not completely full and trimmed as required by the stability book, the cargo can shift, resulting in the ship listing and compromising the ship's safety. Technology upgrades and ship capacity. If new equipment is installed to improve ship energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then the first questions that need to be clarified are as follows. Will this additional equipment alter the ship's gross tonnage? Will this additional equipment alter the ship's light weight? Tonnage regulation does make some allowances for the parts of the ship that do not carry cargo. However, if a ship is designed with GHD reducing equipment or any other equipment that increases the gross tonnage, there will be a financial penalty over the whole of the lifetime of the ship, as port dues are often calculated on the gross tonnage of the ship. This situation can be resolved by amending the 1969 Convention of the IMO so that allowances can be made for installation of equipment that reduces GHG. But this has proved to be very difficult to do even for safety reasons. The ship owner or manager must take these considerations into account when deciding if it is viable to install new equipment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on a new or existing ship if the modification will lead to an increase in the measured gross tonnage. On the lightweight side, and its increase due to the installation of new equipment, including energy efficiency technology, it is important to note that based on load line convention, this increase in lightweight will equally reduce the summer load line deadweight and thus reduce the ship's capacity. This will work against energy efficiency especially for ships that normally are operated at their maximum capacity commercially. Despite the above two cautions, it is worth noting that the great majority of the energy efficient technologies will not alter gross tonnage or maximum dead weight of a ship in any significant way. However, the issue of installation of new equipment on board, if they are heavy or add to gross tonnage, needs to be taken cautiously for energy efficiency and port due purposes. Ship loading aspects. The distribution of cargo on board and the amount of ballast needed to maintain adequate stability, particularly with ships that carry a large amount of deck cargo, is critical. Also, information on the ship's optimum trim and optimum amount of ballast on board for a particular voyage is needed. Ships are designed to carry a certain amount of cargo at a certain speed for a certain fuel consumption that generally results 
in a particular trim for the vessel when fully loaded and in ballast. Trim has a significant influence on the resistance of the ship through water and of the effectiveness of the rudder and propeller. The trim of the ship is important both to carry the maximum amount of cargo safely and maximize the fuel efficiency of the ship. Optimized trim can give significant fuel savings and for any draft there is trim condition which will give minimum resistance and increase the efficiency of the engine. There are two main factors that affect the trim of the ship. One is the shape of the underwater form of hull water plane area at a particular draft and the other is the distribution of weight such as ballast water, cargo and fuel in the vessel. The centre flotation of the hull is normally at the centre of the vessel and changes with the change in draft. This also has a major impact on how the vessel trims and handles in a seaway. The optimum trim for a particular ship at a particular draft will be computed at the design stage and the shipbuilder should make reference to the ship design provided. For bulk ships, this is normally relatively simple as the ship is normally either fully loaded or in ballast. For ships on liner runs that may visit many ports and often have different drafts, the situation is more complex and careful trim is maintained. In some ships, it may be possible to access and apply optimum trim for fuel efficiency throughout the voyage. Just in time and virtual arrival. This slide provides some important definitions. One, just in time or JIT. This concept and the practices originate from the manufacturing industry where it is used to reduce the inventory levels and associated costs. In the case of shipping, JIT normally refers to process improvement to reduce the unnecessary waiting and idle periods of ship operations. In shipping, JIT applies to both en route operation and port operation. Two, voyage management. Voyage management refers to all ship management activities that lead to an optimal planning and execution of a voyage. Like other management practices, all aspects of planning, execution, monitoring and review of voyage are included in this concept. Three, virtual arrival is a new operational concept that aims to remove barriers to JRT operation and reduce port level delays. So one could say that virtual arrival is a technique by which the JIT operation is achieved through removing the existing barriers. Just in time and virtual arrival, why ships wait? Why do we need JIT? Is there a problem with the ship's operation? The answer is to do with the expectations of various stakeholders from a ship. Commercial ships movement is influenced by many factors such as the requirements of cargo owner, mainly charterers, on when and where the cargo should be loaded and discharged or unloaded. The slotting issue in ports in terms of berth availability or cargo space availability. Early arrival and competing for early loading and discharge is common industry practice. Regulatory issues that may lead to prevention of injury to certain ports or detention for some periods of time. The lost time is later on normally recovered by overspeeding. Technical failures that lead to loss of ship availability. Lack of business, cargo, resulting in short or long idle times. Just in time and virtual arrival. Best practice for improvements. How can we improve? How can we move closer to JIT operation? Here is a list of things that need to be done. Avoid waiting periods in all phases of a voyage or modes of operation. Aim for early communication with the next port in order to give maximum notice of berth availability 
and facilitate the use of optimum speed, encourage good communication between fleet department, master and charterer, improve cargo handling operation and avoid delays at berth to the extent that this is possible. E-navigation. The IMO Marine Safety Committee, or MSC, has set a strategy on five solutions to provide a basis for supporting e-navigation. S1, improved harmonization and user-friendly bridge design. S2, means for standardized and automatic reporting. S3, improved reliability, resilience and integrity of bridge equipment and navigational information. S4, Integration and presentation of available information and graphical displays received by communication equipment. S5. Improved communications of VTS service portfolio. The solutions S2, S4 and S5 are designed to improve communication between ship and shore for safety purposes. These initiatives will have implications for ship energy efficiency through better routing and reducing delays. E-navigation related tools. Voyage performance analysis. This system measures ship speed, shaft propulsion power, and the external environment situation and helps with voyage management. Electronic chart display and information system or EC DIS. The electronic chart and information system has the potential for improving navigational practices. Autopilot precision and effectiveness. A more adaptive autopilot that can provide better automatic steering actions to prevailing weather conditions and sea state. Maneuvering assistance tools. With the introduction of modern information and communication technologies, more and more assistant tools have been introduced, additional to the standard mandatory navigational bridge equipment. Integrated navigational systems. This can achieve fuel savings by keeping cross-track error to a minimum while in passage. This technology has been brought about by extremely accurate GPS position information. Computerized maneuvering assistance tools. These take into account the prevailing environmental conditions such as wind and current, ship condition, current course, speed, draft, and the trim of the vessel. As can be seen, e-navigation provides significant new opportunities for optimizing navigation actions in favor of safety and environmental protection. Weather routing. The fuel consumption for a ship not only depends on speed, but also on water depth and weather conditions. The optimal speed distribution along the route can be calculated in advance if a weather forecast is available. Weather routing develops an optimum track for ocean voyages based on weather forecasts, sea condition, and a ship's individual features for a particular transit. Within specified weather limits and sea conditions, weather routing aims to maximize safety and crew comfort, minimize time underway, and minimize fuel consumption. To provide all of the above, weather routing service providers are now supporting ship operations. Thank you. This slide completes the current module.